Okay, I had a question about the scrapbook is like supposed to be an actual scrapbook. It's supposed to be a digital scrapbook that you use something like, I recommend either using PowerPoint, since you all have free access to Microsoft Office, or Google Slides, if that's what you prefer, and then have one entry on each page. And each page should have a picture for your media. So if it's from a video, just take a screen cap of one frame, you know, or if it's a picture, which they usually are a picture, and then you should have headings that are really clear and easy to find that say where you found it. So if it, you found it online, which is, since it's digital, where almost everyone finds your stuff, you put the URL. Or if it was in the newspaper or something, you know, the reference, and the date you found it. And then you have, I, I'm sure I have the topics out of order or the things out of order on there, but you have the interest, what about it is interesting to you. What the textbook says, it needs to have the section in the textbook and at least a paraphrase of what the textbook says about what's going on here. And then um, relevance, how this is relevant to what we've been lecturing on in class. And I'm sure there is something I missed. I think there's one more item and I can't remember what that last item would be. Okay. Yeah. From like this physics textbook or from Perusal because I haven't figured out how our textbooks fit in yet with well, Perusal being a reading. Perusal Perus is using the textbook. It's okay, the so that part. is our textbook. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I, I'm looking here to make sure I go with the last pieces so I don't leave it partial. I'm sure, it's in here somewhere. There it is. Okay, media source. Oh, yeah, the, the media was the picture. That was, I didn't call it the media, that's what messed me up. So I did have everything. Okay. And the entries should cover the range that's on each test. Their time, they're due on like Monday, the day before the exams. So you have five entries on the stuff that's covered in that exam. Yes? For the perusal readings, are comments supposed to be anonymous? They're supposed to be a Apparently, you have to go and set it for each one. I thought that they would all just be anonymous when I set my settings to make them anonymous. Yeah, because I, I want people to not feel any like, what if somebody thinks I'm dumb? Or what, yeah, what if everybody knows it's Sarah? I said I wouldn't refer to her anymore. Now everyone knows that she said on this one. Yeah, yeah. I, I did not know that. Well, I, I will I will work on making sure they're all anonymous. Like they were anonymous in the first one, right? So I will check the rest and then try to modify them so they're all anonymous. Because that's the goal. Okay, getting started with the lecture. Um, like I said, DJ was supposed to be here, and then we were going to finalize exactly what times he would do tutoring sessions starting next week. And so maybe he'll show up late, and then we can do that. But in the meantime, just reviewing what we talked about last class period, we talked about kinematics, talking about position or yeah, can, position versus displacement, speed and velocity. And then this lecture, we're going to hopefully get those past tutoring times, talk about two dimensions a little bit, the reference frames, and then talk about acceleration and the kinematic equations and how to solve some problems with those. So that's where we're going today. This here is of course a figure that we talked about last class period and worked out a problem for the average speed and average velocity. Well, the reason I have this again is to get to the graphing. So here are graphs of that motion. So if you look at the motion, it was going out for half of that 30 minutes. So for 15 minutes or one quarter of an hour, because it has hours on its horizontal axis. And so this graph is plotting its position as a function of time. And oddly enough, I could have sworn it said three kilometers. Yes, it says three kilometers there. And this graph says that it's six kilometers away. I didn't notice that aspect of the graph. <laughs> this is coming straight from the textbook. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be. Huh? No, because it's going out six kilometers and then coming back six kilometers, or in this graph. Yeah, it should go three kilometers. Yeah, it should go out three kilometers and then back three kilometers. So 
what's important about this is, and, and like I said, this is the focus of what we're going to be doing in lab next week. We traditionally put time on the horizontal axis and position or velocity or speed on the vertical axis if we're doing speed versus time. Yes, Randy? Always because time's independent, right? Independent. Time is the independent variable, right? And I, in the lab guide, you'll see I spent a whole lot of time talking about dependent and independent variables. In your pre lab quiz, you probably have one or two questions about that. Yeah. So time is the independent variable, which is almost always what we put on the x axis. And then the dependent variable is the speed, velocity, position. And so for the trip out, it was going at a constant speed. And what does the constant speed line look like here? Straight line. Now, a good question is why is it a straight line for constant speed? And I can explain this quickly. The definition of speed is the change in position, i.e. the distance, over the change in time. Well, if you find the slope for a straight line on a graph, what method did you learn? Rise over, Rise over run. Rise over run. So if I take this graph and I want to find the slope, I am going to have to take the rise, which since that's position, the rise is delta x, and divide by the run. And since that's time on the horizontal axis, that's delta t, right? Horizontal axis, delta t, so the run is, or time, so the run is delta t. Vertical axis is position, so the rise is delta x. And so if I take the slope, I get, I know that, that x is horrible. I get delta x over delta t was our definition for speed. But I should actually be a little more careful because, okay, that's a straight line, delta x over t. You know, if velocity is constant, then delta x over t has to be constant. So it's a straight line. But notice that going out, it was a positive slope. Coming back, it's a negative slope. So that's not really the speed for the slope. What is it? If it has positive going out and negative coming back, which one had positive and negative? The velocity. So the slope is really the velocity. Positive slope is positive velocity with whatever your reference frame is. Negative slope is a negative velocity. Now the next two graphs are to illustrate the difference in velocity and speed. The velocity was positive going out and negative coming back. So you have positive, drops to zero, all the way down to negative, like that. Whereas the speed was constant. So the graphing, in physics we use graphs a lot because hopefully after lab on Tuesday you will also be able to look at a graph and very quickly identify what's going on. Being able to get the whole picture in one little graph instead of having to read lots and lots of words. So it's a concise way of telling us what's going on, very heavily utilized in physics. Any questions about the graph in here? I should also ask any questions about homework that's due tonight. Huh? There's only one homework due tonight, yes. It's it's homework number two. Oh. Yeah. The scrapbook is due the Monday before each exam. Monday before. Yeah. All right, moving forward then. Here's a problem for you to work with the people at your table. A student runs from Prescott Hall to Holmes Lake Dam, that's probably one kilometer east, and then runs to the end of the dam, that's one mile north, in 30 minutes. And you're asked, what was her average speed and what was her average velocity? And, okay, that's right. I'll be mother.
Hey Siri. How many monitors? Hey bro, go ahead. <laughs> Water one mile, one point six zero nine three four. Remember, I did say work with your table. Don't just isolate. We want everyone, you know, if somebody is getting something, share the love. And I should warn you, the second part about finding average velocity requires you to do something we haven't done yet. No, it's not calculus. <laughs> it's trigonometry. That's right. It's trigonometry. No, it's trigonometry. It's, uh, I got that. I got that. I got that. You can be able to look. I got that. 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 Yeah, which would be this slope, which is my Which one? 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 It's the same. Wait, you got the one? Oh, it seems to be. Yeah, we're look at the number. Did you do it in miles? Yeah, I did. No, no, no. So the average velocity was 1.1 seven, seven, seven miles. And the average speed It should be. Oh, no. no. So the Yasha, 
Well, I use a different thing, but it's just a little small. So, one kilometer is one kilometer. Well, you should be divided into a few atoms. Okay. I'll answer that because that, that's an important question. Like I said, this is something I haven't talked about. I wanted you to think about it first and then see how it's done. Okay, it looks like everybody has the speed, I think, and most are working on the velocity. So let's go through and solve this problem. Now, I talked about problem solving steps last class period. What was the first step? Understand the Make sure you understand. Okay, in, in this lecture, I have a different set, and that's the first one, and that one is the picture. Make sure you understand the problem is the first step. And so in this, for me to understand the problem always starts with a picture. And in fact, on the exams for the last three questions, it can be graded either right or wrong or partial credit. And if it's being graded by partial credit, <coughs> what is it? 20 or 30% of your grade is on your figure. Just you're showing you understand what's going on with the problem. So here I have... The student starts at Prescott Hall and runs to the Home Lake Dam, which is one kilometer east, with a traditional coordinate system. Those are the directions. You don't have to go with that. You can use whatever you want. But I'm going to go with that because that's traditions. Um, I'm not going to worry about straight lines today. So she goes one kilometer east, one kilometer. And then for the second part of her trip, she goes one mile north, one mile. And thankfully, many people right off the bat said, hey, we've got a unit thing. We need to convert to one type of units. So I didn't say what units to use. That means you can make a decision on your own what units you want. What units did you guys decide for distance? Miles. Miles? Wow. Okay. I am going to use meters. Okay. No, okay. I'll use miles. We all use miles. We don't use miles all that much, though, in physics, you know? We don't use it in physics all the time. We use it. Even, even though, as I said, officially we changed the metric system back in 1975, and then, you know, everybody got it. Nobody here was alive in 1975, right? Except for me. But I remember all of the roadsides being changed, so they had both the speed in miles per hour and in kilometers per hour. And then people said, oh, that's so confusing. I'm dumb. And they changed back. Okay, they didn't say I'm dumb, but that's what they were implying. Um, and they changed all the distances. So to drive to LA instead of 350 miles, it was, you know, 500 some kilometers. Okay. So we'll do it in miles. So I have to convert one kilometer to miles. So I'll take that one kilometer and multiply it by what is my conversion factor always have to equal. It always has to equal one. And so we know we have kilometers on top, so I need kilometers on bottom to cancel out. I need miles on top. Make sure you put the I with the miles so it doesn't get confused with meters. If you do minutes, you got to put the N, M-I-N, so it doesn't get confused with miles or meters. And then we know that one mile is 1.609. That says 1.609, just trust me, kilometers. And so somebody who did that calculation, what did you get? Point six two two, really? Wow, I'll I'll 
I'll say that's correct. Yeah. Then. All right. So we have that. And then we have, of course, delta x1 is equal to 0 0.622 miles. Delta x2 equals 1 point. And I, was, I don't have significant digits here. I'm just going to throw two zeros in there. I really should have given you more significant digits. Otherwise, you should have all rounded your answers to one digit, right? Because that's what I had for significant digits there. Bad, bad form. Um, and then we had the delta T is equal to 30 minutes. What units did you use then? Zero point five zero zero hours. And that we do not generally just put H for hours. Okay, so I have my data, what I need for part one. And then I have to think about my, you know, the next thing is think about the ideas. And at this point, our ideas are very minimal. Huh, speed is distance over time. And so I'm going to just do for the first part, and I will label it A here. V average equals delta X. Almost did part B there. Equals, so delta X, that'd be delta X1 plus delta X2. Right, that's my total distance traveled. Distance 1 plus distance 2. Divided by delta T. And to save myself just a little hassle, I'm just going to do the math in my head. You know, 1 plus 0.622 is 1.622. 1.622 miles divided by 0 0.500 hours equals 3.24 miles per hour. And I know I saw that in a lot of people's paper. Good job. That was what you had already seen me do examples of and showing that you understood it. Did you have a question, Claudia? No. Okay. But then we have part B. It just changed from speed to velocity, but what's the difference in speed and velocity? Direction. Vector, direction. So now I have V average with a vector sign over it <clears throat> equals delta X with a vector sign over it over delta T. So now when I add the vectors, I can still put as delta x1 with a vector over it plus delta x2 with a vector over it divided by delta t. But that's now going to be 0 0.622 miles east plus 1.00 miles north over 0 0.50 meter, <clears throat> zero, zero hours. So that's gonna be a little different. I know some people did this correctly, but I'm just gonna ask you the questions and we'll get to our answer. How do you add these two vectors? What was the rule for adding vectors? Tip to tail. Tip to tail. So that means, look, I already have them laid out tip to tail because, you know, what? as you're running, you didn't teleport and I drew just what you did as you run. And so they're already laid out tip to tail. So my resultant, my displacement is the resultant here going from the starting point to the ending point. Now, this is a right triangle. For right triangles, we have special rules like the law of cosines. How many people know the law of cosines? Okay, that was three or four hands. I think it's four hands. There is a special case of the law of cosines that everyone knows. If it's a right triangle, the law of cosines becomes the Pythagorean theorem. And so this is a right triangle. Right triangle means it has a right angle there. And so in this case, my magnitude, the length of this is found by just taking, and I saw people doing this, square root of 0 0.622 miles squared plus 1 mile squared. 
And so since people did that, what do we get when we do that? One point what? Okay, yeah, good enough. So now I have this is equal to 1.178 miles divided by 0 0.500 hours. There's one thing missing though. It's a vector. What does a vector need? Direction, direction and I don't have direction. So I'm gonna need to get myself an angle from a reference point. Once again, traditionally we'll say, let's use east as our reference point. And we pretty much always measure angles positive going counterclockwise. And the traditional symbol for an angle is the Greek lowercase th, theta. So if I want to find that theta, I once again have to turn to trigonometry. So let's just look at some trig functions. First, sine. For a right triangle, these are only correct for right triangles, by the way. For a right triangle. We have sine of theta is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. In this triangle, I have to identify what the opposite is. It depends on which angle I am using, which side is opposite. The opposite, ang or the opposite side is the side that is not contributing to that angle. So that angle is between A and C, so the opposite side is the remaining side, B. So the opposite here is B, and okay, I'm just gonna change the color of this because it's gonna look like I'm mixing things together if I keep it at this color. And change it to that, well, that. So that's equal to B divided by, and then hypotenuse. The hypotenuse for a right triangle is always the longest side of the triangle. And if, not, if that's not abundantly clear to you, it's also the side that is opposite to the right angle. So the side that's not part of the right angle, the right angle between A and B is C. So sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse or B over C. Now in this problem, we knew B was one mile and we calculated that C is 1.178 miles. So I could use those to find the angle, but I'm not going to. I like to minimize the calculated numbers I use. So let's go on. So that's sine, cosine, really changed. I tried twice to change the color, I didn't want to. So it, it's staying. Cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. Hopefully my handwriting is legible enough for you to figure out. So we've already identified the hypotenuse is C. The adjacent side is the side that's making part of my angle that's not the opposite one. And not the hypotenuse, well, excuse, excuse me, not the opposite, not what I'm going to say, not the hypotenuse. So the, the angle theta is made between A and C, so the other one making the angle is A. So once again, I calculated C and I knew A, so I could use this. But I want to go to the one that doesn't require me to use the calculated length. And so that brings us to our third, and now the pin color changed, of the common trig functions. Obviously, there's more than just these two. Tangent theta is opposite over hypotenuse, or sine theta over cosine. And in this triangle, opposite was B, opposite over hypotenuse, whoops, opposite over adjacent. Adjacent was A, and there I don't have my calculated value C. So that's the one I'm going to use. I know B and A, and I'm looking for theta. You can start to see why algebra is required for this class, right? And understanding the trigonometry is going to be essential. How do I solve this for theta? I use the inverse tangent, otherwise known as arc tangent. 
and your calculator may have different ways of writing it. Your calculator could have it written as tan minus one or a tan or I tan. Those are all used by calculators to say inverse tangent or arc tangent. And so I do that on both sides of my equation. So I'm going to do tan minus one of tangent theta equals tan minus one of B over A. The definition of an inverse function is the inverse function of a function gives you the original. So inverse tangent of tangent theta is going to give me theta, the original. And so the left side now is the simple theta, there, theta equals inverse tangent of, and now I'm going to put in my numbers, B was the one mile and A was the 0 0.622 miles. And so then I have to pop that in my calculator. Now, when you're putting it in your calculator, pay attention to the units. You could have degrees or you could have radians. This one tells me nicely that it's in degree mode. So if I do arc tangent of 1.609, it's the easiest way to do that, since the 0.622 was 1 over 1.609. I, I did something wrong there because it says 0 0.028 degrees, and that ain't right. Um, I did put in the right numbers, right? Yeah, I think, I think this calculator did something horribly bad. Oh, I did tangent instead of arc tangent. Yes. Yeah, so remember to press the second. Uh-oh. The second should have given me arctan, I thought. Are you going to want um, <coughs> degrees of radians? Okay, am I going to want degrees or radians? For now, we're going to be with degrees. Later on, we'll go to radians. We'll, we'll talk about the difference in them. But for now, just stick with degrees. So I'm failing with this TI36X. I can't get the arctangent function. It gives me an error when I try it. What did you get, Andy? 58 point what? Okay, so I'll just put one degrees. So my, my angle is 58.1 degrees. And so for my answer at 58.1 degrees, and then I have to have a designation for that angle, right? The angle by itself doesn't help me. I need to know where I'm measuring from and what direction I'm going from there. So what was my reference direction for that angle? East. East. And what direction was it going toward? And so we put this as north of east. So clearly, Finding the vector here was a little more involved. That's why I stopped you instead of just waiting for everybody to get it done. You hadn't done it yet, but I wanted you to first have to think about what do I have to do here? What are the ideas here that are involved? I have presented them. The, the math itself is, is something that you are expected to know, but I know a lot of people will be rusty at best at it. And so, you know, that's why I go through it in depth. So any questions about how I found those values? Russell? The what? 1.178? The 1.178 was trusting somebody to do the Pythagorean theorem correctly. Maxwell? My question was, in high school, I had a lot of trouble with that north and east. Mm -hmm. like east of north. Okay, so the, the first one is the direction that my angle is going toward. So my arrow here, if you look at this, my arrow was going like that. So it was going toward north from the east axis. So the second one is the reference axis where I'm starting my measurement of angle. And then the first one is where I'm going toward from there. Yes. So if we were to head due north in this problem and then turn west, 
our mm -hmm. velocity vector would be north or west then? Well, it depends on how you calculate it. You could still calculate it north of west, or you could calculate west of north, or you could do something really crazy and calculate it north of east and just go more than 90 degrees. There's more than one way to specify the direction. Sounds way too old. I, I, because I've used up most of my time already and I haven't gotten to acceleration, I need to move forward. But if you, well, we'll come back to those later. So back to the normal presentation. We've done this problem. So things with trigonometry that we need to do a lot of. We need to be able to resolve a vector into components and combine the components into a vector. So we have only done one of them at this point. We haven't resolved a vector into components. We've only taken individual components and combined them into a vector. So this here, not part of what we did in that problem. Suppose I have a vector A that's measured in angle theta from the x-axis toward the y-axis. So I would say this vector is a at theta y of x, where, of course, a and theta are numbers that I didn't give you. Well, how do you find the components, or what even is a component? A component means a piece. Is it like a grid? It is, yes. When we're doing this work, the first thing you need to do is to define what your coordinate system is. What's your directions? In two dimensions, you have x and y, and they need to be perpendicular to each other. Now, you know, if you're just given a problem and they don't give you any reference and everything's in one direction, you automatically rotate it so you say, ah, oh, x is the direction it's traveling, and y, who cares? We're not going to use it because it's one dimension. But usually, I mean, you'll have two dimensions. And here it's specified this is x, this is y. And so I have this angle, and I know the hypotenuse. I know the longest angle. So I need to find which side is AX. Is it opposite or adjacent? Adjacent. adjacent. So I need to find the adjacent side. What trig function relates the adjacent side and the hypotenuse? Cosine. Cosine. So if I take cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse, putting in what we have from this picture, I have cosine theta is equal to the adjacent AX over the hypotenuse A. Well, if I want to get AX by itself, I just multiply both sides by A. And I have AX is equal to A cosine of theta. So now I have my X component. What about the Y component? Which a, Y, is, which side of the triangle is that? Okay, you went one question ahead. <laughs> which side of the triangle is it? The opposite. opposite. And then the answer that David gave us, which trigonometric function relates opposite and hypotenuse? And it's sine. So give me a color choice. So I have sine of theta is equal to A, Y over a so doing the same math a y is equal to a sine theta now some people forget the work we just did and they simply remember oh a y is a sine theta and a x is equal to a cosine theta that's going to be true if your angle is from the x-axis toward the y-axis yeah. if it's measured from a different location no that's not correct so when you're breaking a vector into components, and you're going to do this a lot. It's not like a transitory thing, ah, I did it once, we're good. You're going to do it a lot. Make sure you identify where your angle is, and then look at the trig functions for deciding which trig function you need to find the x component, and which you need to find the y component. Because while it's going to be this way at least 70% of your time, because this is our convention, you're going to have cases where it's not that way. And you have to be able to do those. Will you ever like, give us the last few to find other things? Um, yes. You will get a lot of questions that, <laughs> yeah. 
So these functions here, these are the trig functions that probably most of you know, they'll be given to you on the test and you probably have some kind of mnemonic. I don't know, you know, when I was a kid, we didn't have lots of mnemonics. We were too poor, I guess. We just learned sine is opposite of a hypotenuse. But then I did learn about this Indian chief, Sokato. <laughs> sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. Okay, so some of you did not learn that? Okay. Then I had a student when I came here at Union that said, oh, this is what we learned. Some old hippie came a hopping through our alley. I kind of oh, like that one. What was that? That's what she is. I don't know. Oh, Okay. Uh, anyway, but you're gonna get, you're gonna have these equations. You don't have to memorize the equations, but you sure as life have to be able to use them. Then there's these two equations down below. And for instance, I know that Randy, are you taking the dynamic or the stats class? We did this exact same thing. Yeah. yeah. And so, like the first homework problem. My, my son was like, well, at first he didn't realize the picture went with it. <laughs> he was like, isn't it just 500? Because it's the only force. Um, but the easiest way to solve that is to use the law of sines. Mm -hmm. The law of sines applies to, these two bottom ones apply to any triangle, not just a right triangle. The top ones are only correct for right triangles. The bottom ones are correct for any triangle. And so I have, here is angle A. Angle B, angle C, and then by convention, side A is opposite angle A, side B is opposite angle B, side C is opposite angle C. Sine of an angle divided by the side associated with that is the same for all of the um, corners of a triangle. And so that's sometimes very useful. Like I said, for Randy's first homework problem in statics class. Are you in statics as well, Oksana? Yeah. The first one, like I said, that's the law of cosines. Most people know it if theta is 90 degrees. Uh-oh. <laughs> when I was doing this, I was like, why is there a cosine here? And I deleted it. Well, now I remember why there's a cosine there because this is the law of cosines. <laughs> I, was, I thought that I had accidentally, yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a little embarrassing. Wait, so is that 2AB times cosine? Yes, times cosine C. Yeah. And so if C is 90 degrees, cosine 90 degrees is 1, or excuse me, 0, and that term disappears. So that's why the Pythagorean theorem doesn't have that last term because the last term is 0. But these two are also very useful. Um, you'll probably use the Pythagorean theorem a lot and the law of sines less and the law of cosines virtually never. So that's how we resolve a vector into components. Um, an example, let's just do this. We assign a coordinate system. Assign a coordinate system right now. We're just going to take what's given. I'm not going to spend time on it. Identify the angle that you'll be working with, which sides are adjacent and opposite hypotenuse, and you assign the cosine functions to find the components. So in this picture, it doesn't have a nice right triangle drawn for me, right? So I'm going to make my right triangle. How do I make the right triangle? That's actually a good question. Start at the tip and go parallel to one of your coordinate directions. Which one should I choose? Okay. David said why, and so why it is. Why, David? Yes, I am. It's perpendicular to the base of the triangle. Okay. Because it's perpendicular to the base of the triangle. It actually makes the angle they give us interior to the triangle is the reason why y is a good one to use there. But you would have been just as correct if you would have said x. Yep. That would have been just as correct. It's just this theta is equals 27 degrees would have been an exterior angle, and I would have had to do a quick mental calculation say, oh, well, this angle here is also theta. <laughs> Whoops. Okay, so we've defined... One coordinate direction, the other coordinate direction, I start at the tail and go parallel to the other axis. So going with David's directions, there's 
parallel to the other axis, the components by their definition, they have to add up to the whole. The pieces have to add up to the whole. So if I add vectors, the method of adding vectors is the, the tail to tip. And so I need to have this vector here plus this vector here gives me the resultant that I'm trying to resolve. Breaking it into components we call resolve. And then I'll label these. So since this is parallel to the y-axis, it's vy. Since this is parallel to the x-axis, it's vx. And now I'm good to go. So how do I find vy? Um, you could use the... I know the hypotenuse. Which side is vy? Opposite. So the trig function that replaces hypotenuse and opposite is sine. So that's V sine theta is equal to 25 meters per second. You'll notice I always put my units in here. And then you pop that in the calculator. Since we only have four minutes left, I'm not going to do that. What about the X component? We're also not going to do that. Uh, don't you have to solve for this angle first? Um, no, it was given in, in the picture. Uh, you use cosine. Wow. So for the X, that's the adjacent side. The adjacent side and hypotenuse relate through cosine. And that's how we resolve a vector into its components. Now, the reverse of that is combining them. And we did an example of combining them. What was that? Yes. The reverse of that is going to involve using, just like we did before, inverse tangent and the Pythagorean theorem. By the way, while people are writing, you may have noticed that you got an email from OneNote thing. That's where I've uploaded my lectures along with the, the work I do on the, the OneNote slides. So you can, can see them there. And I do have the lectures up to date on YouTube, so you can listen to them there. Okay, moving forward. I'm not going to spend the time to do this because we only have three minutes left. I'm also not going to do that and instead get straight to acceleration. There was a lot of discussion on proves all about acceleration and the term deceleration. Let me say right off the bat, um, since everybody knows who said what on this one, Sarah, <laughs> acceleration is a change in velocity. So velocity is a vector. It has magnitude, what we call speed, and direction. So if you change speed, that's an acceleration. Or if you change direction, that's acceleration. But then there's that word deceleration, which is what I was actually referring to. I just don't use the word deceleration. Deceleration is a legit word, but it is confused, and you don't need it when you just use acceleration. Deceleration means acceleration in the direction opposite to velocity. So deceleration means acceleration in the direction opposite to velocity. As in like well, it's, 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 it's slowing down, right. Velocity is going this direction, deceleration is going opposite that. It's just accelerating. Oh, yeah. It's... So if you were driving down the highway and you started to turn mm -hmm. uh, right because that's the way it went, if later on you had to go back to the left, is that deceleration? No, deceleration would not apply to changing direction. It's just it's Only to slow down. down. It's, deceleration is exclusively acceleration. It's in the opposite direction of the velocity. So it's like if you're like going forward and then you mm -hmm. like put it in reverse and then you just like wham, like the other way going faster backwards and you are that, like, That's so smart to do, by the way. The <laughs> transmission is not <loving. laughs> But you're not going slower, but you're still going in the opposite direction of your initial velocity. Yeah. So it, of course, you didn't have a chance to read this, but I, I answered that on the, uh, the proofs all. Okay. If, if you do that, you're decelerating until you stop and then you're accelerating after that. Even though it's constant acceleration throughout. Okay. That's another reason to not use the word deceleration because that sounds really confusing. But 
But then when does like that negative acceleration come into play? Because it sounded like the two were if, different. If you say so. negative acceleration, then that means an acceleration in the direction you're going. So that would be acceleration. Right, a negative deceleration would be acceleration in the direction you're going. Exactly. And you're just really confusing things. By, by the time you say negative deceleration, it's like oh, you're really so. Yeah. 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 That's a double yeah. negative. Yeah, it's exactly. It's a double negative. negative. So I'm just not going to use the word decelerate. I'm just going to use accelerate. You can accelerate in any old direction you want. So what three changes in motion, if you're driving your car, what three changes in motion would correspond to acceleration? I put one there for you. Slow down. What are the other two? Change in direction. Speed up. Well, stop is slow down. Change in direction. So if you speed up or you change direction or you slow down, all of these are accelerations. So in your car, you have three accelerators. You have the gas pedal, you have the brake pedal, and you have the steering wheel. All of those will result in accelerating the car. Okay, I am sorry, we're totally out of time. Have a happy Sabbath. Enjoy John Bradshaw. I'm so confused. Can I like walk around and ask you questions? Absolutely. Um, okay. So if I'm facing this way and moving forward, yes. I have a velocity in this direction. Mm -hmm. And if I'm increasing that, then I also have acceleration in that direction. In this direction. But if I go back to zero and I go backwards, I'm having a velocity in a negative direction. And then if I speed up, then I'll have it in negative acceleration. Okay, so if I go back to zero again, and I start off faster and then slow down, then I have a positive and a negative acceleration. Okay, and then if I go back to zero again, and I go backwards fast, I understand like that one way, but like the concept doesn't make up that word. Like it, I'm not going to accept that that word because I don't know Well, acceleration is the change of velocity. If your if your acceleration is that direction. And that means your velocity has to be changing toward that direction. So if you're at zero and it's accelerating that way, that's your velocity. Then your velocity in the next second is going to be going that direction. If you're going backward, you have a negative velocity and a positive acceleration. Your velocity is going to be going more forward, which means it's going to be going more positive, becoming less negative. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can you go back to the slide with the North hypotenuse and the? Huh? I'm gonna get the door. Oh, this one. Yeah. That one. Okay. For v of um, or the one with the vx. Yes. Where do you go? The cosine. I get the cosine as a base of hypotenuse. I just don't know. I feel like isn't the 25 meters per second on the hypotenuse? Yes. Wouldn't it be adjacent over hypotenuse? The Okay, so the hypotenuse always is by itself, right? It's always right. the side opposite the right angle. And then the adjacent is the other one that's making my angle. So for my 27 degrees, Vx is the other side that's making the angle of 27 degrees. And so that means Vx is the adjacent side. And so if you write it out, cosine theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, that's going to be... Vx was my adjacent side. Oh, you just you just arranged the equation, right? What? Yes. Okay, never mind. I'm stupid. Okay, thank you. You are not stupid. This still, I'll take it off the recording. Don't want anyone to think that we say those kinds of things in my class.